it is my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Emma Horton. Uh, my understanding is that Emma did uh, her PhD with Andreas Cupriano. Yep. Yeah. And uh, finished it in 2019, University of Bath, and then she spent uh, about a year at University of Lorraine as a postdoc. And her current uh, affiliation is both University of Melbourne, where she is on secondment for several months, and also uh, Indria Center in Bordeaux. And uh, the next uh, affiliation, uh, as I understand, is Warwick. Yep. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. Yep. So Emma is a young addition, new addition to the probabilistic community, but she already published several very good papers and uh, doubtless today's talk will also be very interesting. So Emma, the screen is yours. So please, will you share your, your computer? We didn't test it. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, can everyone see that? Okay. So thank you for the introduction and of course for the invitation to uh, give this seminar today. Um, so I'm going to speak about um, the asymptotic behavior of critical branching processes. And the motivation for this came for, from uh, a project that I worked on during my PhD on the neutron transport equation. And it's something that I've since looked at in sort of a much more general setting. And in particular, it pieces together a couple of projects, um, one with Isaac Gonzalez Garcia, who is in Oaxaca in, Me Oaxaca in Mexico, um, who was formerly a PhD student at Bath, um, and Andreas Kiprianu, who's now in Warwick, and then another project with Andreas um, Simon Harris in Auckland and Min Min Wang at the University of Sussex. Uh, there we go. Okay. So I'm going to split the talk into three parts. The first, I'll sort of give a motivation um, for why we're interested in looking at these branching processes. Um, and then I'll introduce the, the particular model that I'll talk about for the rest of the, the presentation. And then I'll spend the second section talking about the asymptotic moments of this class of critical branching processes. And the third section talking about some classical results called um, known as the Kolmogorov and Yaglov uh, limit theorems. Okay, so the motivation comes from, as I said, this neutron transport equation, which um, sort of describes the evolution of nuclear fission in reactors. So how these processes move are you start off with a, a single neutron in a reactor and it has some position and velocity, and it will move in a straight line until it collides with um, different materials. It could be uranium, plutonium, whatever in the reactor. Um, one of the things that can happen when such a collision occurs is something called a scattering event. And this is sort of described by this picture here. And it's where the neutron sort of glances off uh, the nucleus in the reactor and then just changes direction. And so it's just given a new uh, velocity and then it continues to move in a straight line. And then the second uh, possible outcome of such a collision is a fission event. And this is where the neutron is temporarily absorbed by the nucleus. It causes the nucleus to become unstable. And then that splits open and releases several more neutrons that then go on and um, copy the behavior of the initial neutron. Um, but when the uh, new neutrons are released from this fission event, they can all have different uh, velocities, which could be correlated, can be independent, um, and so on. And then uh, the other thing that can happen is a neutron is hits the boundary of a reactor, in which case it's absorbed. And so um, I hope you'll believe me when I say that you can use a branching process to model um, this, uh, this nuclear fission process. And in particular, the offspring distribution of this branching process is a bit different in the sense that it's non-local. So this is because when a fission event occurs, even though the, produce, the neutrons are produced at the same spatial position in the reactor, their velocities are different, and this is what makes it non-local. And as with uh, any other branching process, we can give it three regimes. So the supercritical case, so this is where you have too uh, many neutrons in your reactor, um, which obviously is very dangerous. Um, a subcritical, where you have an exponential decay of the number of neutrons in your reactor. 
and critical, where you have this perfect balance between neutron production from fission and neutron absorption at the boundary. Um, and this is obviously the case, sort of the desirable case where a reactor will be operated. And so this is why we wanted to look at uh, limit theorems and sort of ways to characterize the behavior of critical branching processes uh, for exactly this reason. And so this is just a, a small picture of a typical uh, neutron branching process. So you start with a single particle here and then a fission event occurs, it releases more neutrons. Um, and you can see scattering events here and absorption at the boundary. And so it's well known in the literature that um, for, for example, Galton Watson processes and other branching processes, that one way to characterize um, the limiting behavior of critical branching processes is to look at the uh, Kolmogorov uh, limit for the survival probability and the Yaglom limit. And so what are these two results? So it's suppose we start off with a binary equal to Watson process. And we're going to assume that the process is critical so that the offspring district, the expectation of the offspring uh, distribution is equal to one and its variance is finite. Um, and I'm missing a square term here. Then the Kolmogorov limit states that asymptotically the survival probability behaves like a constant over N. And um, this constant depends on the variance of the offspring distribution. And then it was proved by Yaglom 10 years later that if we condition on survival and take a look at the process rescaled by N, then this converges to an exponential distribution um, whose parameter is again given by some constant that depends on the variance of the offspring distribution. And then, of course, uh, several people went on to look at this under varying, varying moment assumptions um, and for super processes as well. And then the other case that I wanted to mention was um, Yaglom limit for uh, branching diffusions. So we let D be some bounded domain, some subset of RD. And we consider the process XT, which is just a branching diffusion. So um, in between branching events, given the point of their creation, particles just move around D according to some diffusion, and we denote it generated by L. Particles are killed on the boundary of D, and then at some constant rate beta, they split into a random number of particles um, with distribution given by A. So if lambda denotes the first eigenvalue of minus L, which is, was the generator, of the diffusion. Um, and we assume that the mean of this offspring distribution is greater than one, then the critical case is given when lambda is equal to the branching rate beta minus one. And in this case, back in 2019, Ellen Powell, who's at the University of Durham, proved um, the same kind of results. So the Kolmogorov result and the Yaglom limit for um, this class of branching diffusions on a uh, bounded domain. So um, again, we have some constant that depends on the initial position of the branch in diffusion, um, which is the limit of T times the survival probability. And again, conditioned on survival, when we look at the empirical distribution of the branch in diffusion, renormalized by T, this converges in distribution to um, an exponential random variable. And so we wanted to do exactly the same thing. We wanted to prove these two types of results for uh, a class of critical branching processes that include this um, neutron branching process that I mentioned on the first couple of slides. So let's define this class of branching processes. So we take E to be some Polish space, and this is going to be the space where the particles live and we'll append to it some symmetry state delta. And this is just gonna be the state where all the particles are sent when they're absorbed. And we're going to talk about, um, well, the motion of the particles in between branching is going to be given by a potentially sub-Markov process, Xi, um, which has semi-group PT. 
So PTFF just gives the average of the position of this Markov process psi under the action of some function f, um, as long as it's still alive. So for any time before its killing time, which is given by terpene. So if we think back to the neutron branching process, um, this is just the time at which a particle would hit the um, domain of the reactor, the, the boundary of the reactor zone. And so as I say, so given the point, their point of creation, particles will evolve independently in E according to this sub Markov process. And then when they're killed, um, they're sent to this semester state um, delta. So this killing, we don't give any restrictions on what this killing could look like. It could happen according to some exponential rate. So it could be soft killing. It could also be when it hits the boundary if E is bounded. And when a particle is at a position X in E, at rate beta of X, it dies and is instantaneously replaced by a random number of new particles. And the distribution um, of the, these new particles is given by a point process Z, uh, whose law is given by this curly P of X. Um, so we have a random number N and their positions are Y1 up to YN. And we don't assume that the YI have to be placed at the position X. So they could be scattered anywhere in the domain. Um, and I'll give several examples of, of different uh, types of offspring distribution in a couple of slides, but this is just quite general. So at position X, you just scatter in the domain um, a random number of particles wherever you are. And then the configuration of particles at time T is then going to be denoted by X1 of T up to X N T of T, where N T is the number of particles alive at time T. So then the branching process um, is defined to be this uh, collection of atomic measures, xt. And so this is just where we put a delta mass at each of the xi's and add them all up. And we'll denote by its law p mu, where mu is the initial distribution. And we're going to be interested in the average behavior of um, this process. So if I define um, F xt, the inner product of F and xt, to be um, F applied to each of the particles and add it all up, then its expectation semi-group is just the average of this when started from a single particle at position X. And it's the long-term behavior of uh, this expectation semi-group um, that will dictate the criticality of the system. Okay, so we'll see this on in a couple of slides. But it's it's this and another related semigroup that I'm going to be interested in the long-term behavior um, to look at these sort of Kolmogorov and Yaglong type results. Okay. And on this class of branching processes, I'm going to impose an assumption, which I call H1. And it's a kind of Perron-Frobenius type assumption. So it says that there exists a constant lambda, which is a real number, some bounded positive function phi on E, and some finite measure phi tilde, such that phi is the right eigenfunction for the expectation semigroup with respect to the um, eigenvalue E to the lambda T. And then similarly, phi tilde is the left eigenmeasure for this semigroup corresponding to the same eigenvalue. And so really what this is saying is that I assume that there's a constant that describes the um, growth rate of the system. So lambda is the average rate of the number of particles in the system in the long term. Um, and so in particular, if lambda is positive, this means I have an exponential uh, growth of the number of particles in the system. If it's negative, um, I get an exponential decay of the number of particles in the system. And if it's equal to zero, I get this perfect balance between particle production and particle death. And so we see exactly, we have the usual three regimes, the uh, supercritical, subcritical, and critical. And the functions phi and the measure, well, the function phi and the measure phi tilde um, kind of describes the 
sort of good points and the um, points where you're most likely to get killed in the reactor. So five gives a kind of importance to a point in a reactor and tells you how, um, if I start uh, a process from this point, how that will contribute to the, the future of the process. And then phi tilde we can kind of see as a, as a sort of stationary measure. And the way we make this sort of idea of station measure more rigorous is to say that we assume that if I take the expectation of semi-groups of the average of the system, I normalize by the growth rate and I normalize by this kind of, um, this importance for each point to X, for each initial point X, then this quantity converges to the inner product of F and phi tilde. And we assume that this happens exponentially quickly. And so here, this is how we see phi tilde is a kind of stationary distribution and gives a profile of the domain of where you're more likely to get killed or more likely to, to branch and survive and spend your time in the long run. So what kind of processes live in this class of spatial branching processes? Um, so just to name a few, we have multi-type continuous time Galton Watson process with a, a countable number of types. So um, I know Andreas Kipriani worked on this with a PhD student back in 2016, I think. Um, and I'm sure many, many other people have worked on this. Um, BBM on a compact domain. So we've seen there that we have uh, the motion, which is the Markov process is just uh, diffusion. We have a constant branching rate beta, so it doesn't depend on X. And here the offspring distribution was local because all of the points were uh, produced at the same position as the parent particle. Um, of course, the neutron transport process lies in this class. Um, that's kind of the point. Um, so in between branching events, particles behave as a kind of um, piecewise deterministic Markov process. They are sort of just move in straight lines and zigzag according to these scatter events. Um, and we've seen that the, the new particles produced from a fission event are produced according to a non-local um, branching um, generator. And this was because they're um, positioned at the same spatial position, but their offspring are non-local in the velocity space. And uh, this was kind of one of the first uh, things that I proved during my PhD was in fact that we do have this Perrin-Fabinius type result where we have the existence of a, a lambda phi by tilde and it's kind of convergence of the um, mean semi-group. And then finally, um, growth fragmentation process, the last example that I'll talk about. Um, so Jean Bertoin, ETH, and Alex Watson, who's in London, have done a lot of work in this area, and Denis Villemonet in, in um, Nancy, to show that um, we also have this leading order behavior, this Perrin-Frobenius type result for growth fragmentation processes. And so in this case, the offspring distribution is completely non-local because um, a particle can grow according to your favorite um, Markov process. And then at some rate, which can depend on the size of the particle, particle splits into two. Um, and we have a new particle of size y and x minus y, where y is positive. Um, and so the new offspring have a completely different size to the parent particle. So this is why it's non-local. And so as I sort of motivated at the start, the aim of this was to understand the critical behavior um, or the long-term behavior of the critical case. So when lambda is equal to zero of this class. Um, so before I move on, does anyone have any questions on the, the model and the class of branching process that I'm interested in? Okay. So the first thing I'm going to look at is characterizing the asymptotic behavior of the moments of this process. So we're going to assume that lambda is equal to zero so that we're in the critical case. And I'm going to set T T um, superscript K to be the K moment of the branching process or the L. And note in particular that T superscript one is the same as T T, which was the semi-group I defined earlier. And so we already know how the first moment behaves. So k equals one. And our objective is to show that if we take any k greater than or equal to two, then we can find a normalization in time such that if I take the kth moment and normalize by this function gk, 
then I converge as t tends to infinity to some limiting constant. And I want to show this for any k, for any f, for any x. Um, and I want to explicitly identify these functions, g, k of t, and c, k of x and f. So the second assumption that I'm going to now impose is on the offspring distribution. So if we recall n was the random number of offspring that we produce at a branching event, I'm going to assume, assume that for a fixed k, um, the kth moment of this offspring distribution is finite. And this is just kind of to ensure that the kth moment of the whole process is actually well-defined. So if we fix um, some k greater than or equal to two, um, and again, we're assuming lambda is equal to zero and assume that h1 and h2 of k hold. Then if I look at the elf moment of the offspring, of the um, branching process, then this result says that if I normalize by t to the l minus one and five, then my then this quantity converges to a limit that's given by some constants and this sort of inner product that was appearing in the um, parent Frobenius limit, but also a quantity that involves the second moment of the offspring distribution. And so this is quite interesting that even if we look at any moment of the um, whole process, the limit actually only really depends on the second moment of the offspring distribution. And I'll try to explain why this is the case later on. But if just thinking back to what I wanted to show on the previous slide, we show, um, this show, says that g k of t is equal to uh, one over t to the l minus one, and the c k of x and f is equal to this quantity on the right hand side with five x there. So now I'm going to give sort of an idea of the proof. And it's going to be based on an inductive argument. So we know exactly how the first moment behaves from the assumption H1, as I said before. So this is kind of the base case done. And in order to tackle the higher order moments, what I'm going to notice is that the kth moment of the branching process can be written as the derivative of this nonlinear um, semi-group. So if I look at the average when started from a single particle at position x of e to the minus theta times this inner product, differentiate k times and set theta equal to zero, then I get exactly the k moment. So this is kind of indicating that if I want to study the k moment of the branching process, then I can actually study the nonlinear the non semigroup here and then differentiate and set theta equal to zero. And this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to write down an evolution equation for this, um, this nonlinear semigroup. Um, and this, when we differentiate, this will allow us to write the kth moment um, here in terms of all the lower order moments. And this is how we're going to get our inductive argument. So now I'm going to define Vt of f of x to be the nonlinear semigroup. So it's the product instead of the sum now of all the particles alive at time t um, when initiated from a single uh, particle at position x. And so in particular, if we take uh, our test function f to be of the form e to the minus theta f, then we recover exactly the form of the nonlinear semigroup from the previous slide that we were interested in the connection with the kth moment. And because I'm dealing now with the nonlinear semigroup, I need to define the branching mechanism. So it's just going to be the, um, the branching rate beta of x um, times the average of the product of all the particles produced at a branching event minus the initial particle. And so 
if we want to write down a very naive um, evolution equation, the first thing we can do is just do this sort of one step method where we say, okay, at time t, either I've branched or I haven't. So if I haven't branched, then my particle has just moved according to my Markov process um, until time t. So this is this first term, or at some point in between zero and t um, at time s, I've had a branching event and G describes exactly how to um, how my particles branch. And then I put down new copies of the process um, for the remaining units of time T minus X. So this is kind of the sort of most natural, I would say, um, evolution equation to write down. But unfortunately, this doesn't turn out to be the right one uh, to work with. And this is because um, if I was to do exactly what I wanted to do and set f to be of the form e to the minus theta uh, times a function, when I differentiate, I will still I'll get the kth order uh, moment on the left, but I will still get the kth order moment here as well appearing in the um, in the integral term. And I don't want this because I want to use an inductive argument, so I want to somehow get rid of this kth order moment appearing on the right hand side. And the other reason that I uh, this isn't necessarily the right equation to work with is that um, we don't really know anything about the limiting behavior of PT. So what could be the correct um, evolution equation to to write down? So instead I'm instead of sorry instead of VT, I'm going to look at UT, which is one minus VT, and this slight modification just makes it a little bit nicer to to work with. And I'm now going to define a second um, branching type operator, which is a combination of the nonlinear um, branching mechanism and the linear part. And using a kind of combination of this sort of one step method and um, some sort of just manipulating equations, we can show that UT satisfies um, this evolution equation, which turns out to be exactly the right equation to work with. And the reason for that is that we do know the, uh, the limiting behavior of TT because of H1. And when I differentiate um, in theta, when I choose the correct test function here, the fact that I've got this sort of compensation by the linear term will remove the kth order moment that I see appearing on the right hand side. So I just get order of maximum k minus one, which allows me to um, write down this sort of do this inductive argument. Um, and the kind of intuition as to why um, I, see, I can write this as a TT and an A instead of a PT and G is because PT was just the um, linear semigroup of a single particle. So it had mass at most one. But here we've got something that's changing in mass because it's the expectation semigroup of the branching process. And so to compensate for that somewhere, um, the correct thing to do is to add in this linear term here uh, in this sort of new branching generator. So this, this addition of the sum is to compensate for the change of mass from PT to TT. Okay, so now we have our, um, our evolution equation that turns out to be the correct one to work with. We can indeed take our test function to be of the form e to the minus theta f, differentiate k times in theta, set theta to be zero, and obtain a linear, um, an evolution equation for the kth moment. And so here we can see that this operator eta, um, describes how I can make up the kth moment from all the lower order moments. So this set k1 up to kn is all the possible n-tuples such that the sum of the um, elements is equal to k, but at least two of them are strictly positive. So this is exactly um, where we see that any moment that appears in this product here is going to be of order strictly less than k. And this can also be seen as a many to few type formula um, because it's um, looking at the kth moment of a branching process and relates it to sort of lower order moments um, as well, which is, is very related to sort of work by Simon Harris 
and many, many other people on the many to few formula. Okay, so now we have a, a moment evolution equation, we can start looking at the inductive step. So if we recall, our conjecture was that the correct normalization for this k plus one moment was one over t to the k. So if I normalize by t to the k, um, of course, because uh, this is critical, this quantity, this first quantity will go to zero due to the parent Frobenius result. So now we just need to deal with the um, integral term. So now I normalize the integral term by t to the k or one over t to the k. And the first thing I'm going to do is just a simple change of variable. So I'm going to change time from s to ut. And this just gets rid of one of the, um, the values of one over t here. So I've done pretty much nothing there. And now what I'm going to do is just uh, multiply and divide by this factor t um, times one minus u. And this is so that I can apply the inductive hypothesis because we um, recall that this is the correct normalization for all of the lower order terms. Okay, so now I'm going to show how we get each of the terms in this integral to converge so that the whole thing converges together. So this first combinatorial part um, is bounded by n to the k plus one, which is exactly why we need this moment assumption on the offspring distribution. Okay. And if I look at this second term, um, recall that this set is all of the n tuples that add up to k plus one, where at least two of them are positive. If any more than two of them are positive, then this whole thing will go to zero because I'll have too many powers of t here. So it will end up being something like one over t to some power which is positive if I have uh, three or more terms in this sum that are positive. So this indicates that we actually only, in the limit, we only see those terms for exactly two of them um, being positive. And this um, is exactly why in the limit, uh, when I stated the theorem, we only see um, a limit that depends on um, the sort of second order behavior of the offspring distribution. And I guess uh, if anyone's interested at the end of the talk, I can sort of give a more heuristic explanation as to why that's the case, sort of involving um, spine decomposition and so on. Um, but there is sort of like a, a heuristic reason as to why we see only um, two of these positive. So because we only see uh, two of them positive, I can rewrite this um, sum here as the sum of choosing my first index i for, the, for one of the um, n tuples to be positive or one of the elements of the n tuples to be positive. And then the sum over the second one that I choose to be positive. And then I sum over the possible values that the first of these terms k i can be uh, between one and k. And now this product again has only now got two terms for the ith and jth one, which are positive. Um, and the inductive hypothesis ensure that these terms converge to um, this sort of proposed limit that we have. And then the final part, so we've checked that this sort of combinatorial sum is okay. We've checked that um, this term is okay by taking um, only two terms in the sum to be uh, positive. And we know that this final sum, uh, these final products converge. So now we need to take the whole thing and make the whole thing converge with this sort of integral and t of ut. And the way we do that is kind of upgrade this parent Frobenius type result. So we know that the semigroup t um, converges to this inner product. And we can prove a kind of ergodic result that says actually we can upgrade this to saying if we have an integral of this form, then it converges to the integral of um, the limit. 
And this is how we obtain the convergence of the whole integral. Okay, so that kind of finishes the uh, proof of the convergence of the gate moment. And it turns out that actually this method is kind of robust enough to do exactly the same thing for the running occupation measure of the branching particle system. So what now happens if we're interested in looking at the cave moment of the integral of the process up to time t? So I'm not gonna obviously do all the same steps again, but just outline that the, the same kind of um, techniques can be used. So we can again define a sort of nonlinear functional here, which involves the uh, exponential of this occupation. And again, we can write down a nonlinear evolution equation for um, one minus this expectation. And again, under the same assumptions that we had for the previous uh, result, we can show that we can indeed find an explicit normalization in time, which is now one over two to the L minus one. And we can um, find an explicit limit for this quantity. And again, it's sort of only um, including a term that involves the uh, second order behavior of the branching mechanism because of exactly the same reason that we saw in the previous proof. So I won't um, obviously do the whole proof again, but just to give a kind of intuition as to why we expect this normalization of t to the 2L minus one. Um, so suppose that we know that the Kolmogorov um, result holds for the survival probability and that the Yaglom limit result holds. So the conditional on survival, the normalized process by t converges in distribution to an exponential. Then if we look at the cave moment of the occupation measure, if we condition on survival up to time t, then we can expect that this behaves like, um, this sort of inner product behaves like s because, because of exactly this Yaglom resulting. Okay, so then we just do this sort of naive thing, uh, do the integral and this gives us t to the 2k. But this was all conditional on nt being positive. So when we want to undo that, we just multiply by the survival probability and we know that this behaves like some constant over t. So this is exactly why we see the, the normalization uh, one over t to the 2k minus one. Okay. Uh, so now I'll just go on to the final part of the talk. So um, proving these uh, Kolmogorov and Yaglom limit results. And the Yaglom result will indeed use these um, asymptotic moment results. So well, if they're sort of just being nice results on their own, they are quite uh, useful for other things as well. So just a quick recap, we wanted to show that um, the asymptotic behavior of the survival probability was a constant divided by T, where this constant depends on the initial position of the branching system. And that conditional on survival, um, the empirical distribution uh, divided by T converges in distribution to an exponential. And for this, we need to um, introduce three more assumptions. So first of all, uh, we're going to assume that for any sufficiently large time t, no matter what our initial um, state is for the branching process, the survival probability will always be strictly less than one. And of course, this seems intuitive because we're a critical, uh, we're in a critical system, but we wanted to um, ensure that this was true for any sort of potentially weird um, domains e that we could be interested in. The second assumption, um, I'm sort of really not happy with this assumption, to be honest. Um, so we're going to assume that the number of offspring um, produced at a branching event is bounded by some constant n max. So of course, um, this means that we no longer need the assumption H2, which was the cave moment existing. Um, 
And we found that we really needed this assumption because of the non-locality of the process. Um, but I am still looking of ways to, to get rid of this assumption. And then the final uh, hypothesis H5 is this sort of, um, let's say, ellipticity, uniform ellipticity type um, assumption. So this says that if we're in the stationary distribution phi tilde and there's a branching event, then we do at least as well as starting in the stationary distribution from two independent particles. So the typical kind of uh, test function I'm going to use here for the proof is going to be the survival probability. Um, and so this is saying if I, if I branch according to my um, actual distribution uh, given by this point measure, then the survival is at least as good as if I start from two independent particles distributed according to phi tilde. So with Simon Harris, Andreas Kipriano, and Mimi Wang, uh, we showed that under the assumptions H1, 3, 4, and 5, we do indeed have this um, Kolmogorov result for the survival probability. And the limiting constant is, as with the Galton Watson case and the branching diffusion case, is given by um, a quantity that's involving the variance of the offspring distribution. So the proof behind this is not very probabilistic. It's sort of very um, reliant on PD type techniques. Um, so the general strategy is to say, okay, we're going to look at the, obviously the survival probability and also this term AT, which is the uh, UT integrated against the um, stationary distribution. And the first step will be to obtain coarse upper and lower bounds of the order one over T. So we'll show that there exists some constants C1 and C2, such that U and UT and AT are sandwiched in between C1 over T and C2 over T. And then we're going to show that if we take um, this survival probability started from X and divide by, um, phi of x, the right eigenfunction, then this difference with at goes to zero. So this is again kind of, if we think back to the, the Perrin-Frobenius type result, this is again saying that the survival probability kind of acts in this in the same way, that it converges to um, the stationary distribution um, integrated against this sort of test function. And then this, um, convergence will allow us to bootstrap the course bounds that we obtained um, previously to obtain the precise constant that we're interested in. And that's for AT, and then we'll be able to conclude for UT. So that's the kind of strategy. So I will detail these a little bit more. So first, if we recall the nonlinear evolution equation that was UT, which was one minus the expectation of the product. And we can note that the survival probability is um, a solution to this equation because all we need to do is take g to be the zero function. And to obtain the lower bound of um, order one over t, it's very easy. We use very nice martingale arguments and this is very straightforward. But to um, find the coarse upper bound, uh, we have to use some PDE um, techniques along with this uniform ellipticity type assumption H5 um, to obtain um, this upper bound using this equation for AT. I know I'm skipping over a lot of details, but um, because they're not so intuitive, um, it doesn't make sense to go into all the details. Okay. And then we wanted to show that this quantity goes to zero. Um, so the idea is to just write down the evolution equation for UT, write down the evolution equation for AT and look at the difference. So this first term will go to zero thanks to the perrin assumption H1. And then because we can show that this branching uh, generator A kind of behaves at most like the second order term, 
we can combine this again with the H1 and the original course of the bands that we obtained to show that this difference is bounded by C over T squared. And so then if we look at the difference between AT and AT0 for some T0 fixed but sufficiently large, then it's the integral from T0 to T of this uh, inner product. We can show that this branching generator A, which was sort of like the product of one minus something um, taken off the linear term, this behaves like the second order, um, sort of like the variance of the, the offspring distribution plus some uh, higher order terms. From the uh, course upper bounds that we obtained, uh, we know that the survival probability is of order one over S. And then we can use this previous convergence that says that um, U divided by phi is close to AS um, to sort of pull out this term. And this in particular shows that AT um, behaves like uh, one over T with the correct constant. And then we can just say, okay, this is um, use the previous um, result from the previous slide to say that the same is true for UT. And then the final step is to kind of put these all of these things together. So we take the moment result that we obtained um, in the second section and the Kolmogorov result, and this will give us directly the Yaglom limit result. And the way we're going to do this is to look at all of the moments of the process condition to survive. So we can split this up into um, just the kth moment of the process um, divided by survival probability, just by removing this conditioning. And from the moment result, we know that the kth moment when normalized by t to the k minus one converges to um, some quantity, which we know explicitly. And again, from the Kolmogorov uh, result, we know the limit of the denominator. And so we obtain exactly um, something that is the kth moment of an exponential distribution with the correct, um, with the correct constant. And so this gives us exactly the result that we wanted, um, the Yaglon limit theorem. And so, um, I mean, these are all very nice theoretically, but what uh, can we actually do with them? So if we recall the sort of the original motivation for this was the neutron transport equation, the neutron branching process. So we want to try to use these results directly in the industrial setting to tell us something about the convergence or the efficiency of the algorithms involved in um, simulating these uh, for the partners that we work with. Um, we also have started with um, Simon Harris, Andreas Kiprani and Ellen Powell to look at the asymptotic genealogical structure of this, uh, these critical branching processes. So we've shown that a many to few formula exists and now we want to say, okay, if we condition the whole tree to be very large, what's the asymptotic structure of this tree? And we show it converges in particular to something like a Brownian CRT. Um, and then recently we've given that we've shown the same thing holds in the discrete time results, which are equally important in this sort of nuclear um, setting. So I'll finish there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, and does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I We have got several minutes for questions. Please. If you have one, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Can I ask Connie Kostya, mm -hmm. Hannah? Uh, yeah. You mentioned um, processes with, with uh, countably many types as ex examples of uh, processes satisfying H1, but don't you need some mm -hmm. restrictions? To be able to claim H one, um, probably yes. Um, yeah, I mean, off the top of my head, I can't remember what Andres did with his student, but probably. Because yeah. because you've got exponential convergence of something in H one, which is 
quite a strong statement. And presumably, you yeah. need to be able to. Yeah, yeah. So actually, um, so maybe that's something to say. So um, for the moment results, at least, we do not need exponential convergence. We just need um, convergence to zero. But the exponential convergence was in particular used uh, later on for the Kolmogorov result. So that's where actually that was important, how the exponential convergence. Thank you. I mean, that you mentioned this previous result by Powell of um, it's like the same setting, but you you have this diffusion and then the killing is done in a specific <laughs> way. So then are the methods used there the same, uh, like at a high level, obviously, like then to what you're doing? Is that is that right? Uh, more or less, yeah. I mean, so Ellen was able to give a slightly more probabilistic result for the survival probability because she had control over the density uh -huh. of, the, of the system, whereas we don't necessarily have that. Um, but more or less the methods are the same thing. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, any further questions? Right, if there is no further questions, let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much, Emma. I thank and you. Yes, and uh, next week, I believe we have got I, another seminar which will be one hour later than usual time at 6 p.m. Sergei Popov from University of Porto. It's on the web now. The announcement is available there. I will make it uh, also using the uh, mailing list of the seminar. Okay, thank you. Thank you. See you. Thank you so much indeed.